All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. So for announcements, there is no lab this week. So uh, you will, your next lab will be after spring break because next week is spring break. Uh, we will have an exam on Wednesday, March 22nd, so in two days. Uh, check out the announcement on Canvas that's posted there with information on the exam. The exam will be during the regular class time plus 30 minutes grace period to submit your exam and also see the review problems and the practice problems that are posted on Canvas. Uh, right after class, during my office hours, I'm going to work some exam review problems. So stop on by if you'd like to see a few problems worked that are relevant to the exam. They're actually old exam problems. So you can stop by, watch me work those, ask questions, um, and uh, you can join that. Uh, if you have any questions during class, as always, please unmute and uh, or shoot me a chat and we'll discuss your question during class. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we're going to have uh, kind of a continuation of this class into practical electronics. And I wanted to give uh, the sort of the first shot of telling people about it to students of my class so that if you're interested in electronics that applies for uh, uh, to mechanical engineers for more practical problems, um, then I want you to have the first chance to, to see it and sign up. So what I did is I went out and um, over the past few semesters, I asked students, what do you wish you either would, would learn or would want to learn or wish you had learned in this class? I also went to uh, mechanical engineers who work with me in industry who've been there from anywhere from a couple years, some took my class, uh, th through their, their uh, principal engineers now. They've been there for you know, 15, 20 years. What do those mechanicals uh, wish they had learned in circuits class to help them out with their career and just their general knowledge? So I ask them, what do you wish you had learned or hope you will learn about electronics as a mechanical engineer or mechanical engineering student. Um, and so these were the top answers that I got. So these topics will be integrated into the uh, into the class. So uh, electronic sensors, I got comments that, well, yeah, we've used electronic sensors in some data acquisition classes and analysis, but not really how they work. And how do you know when to use, uh, you know, a, a thermocouple over a silicon temperature device over an RTD device? Um, or a photodiode versus a phototransistor for sensing light, or a strain gauge over a load cell, things like that. So uh, I've integrated these topics into the class um, and applied microcontrollers. So many of you have taken an intro class to Arduinos. Uh, this class will go into depth a little more on acquiring measurements and how to use those measurements and communicate those measurements and autonomously respond. And we're actually going to build a closed loop uh, control project that I'll show you. Um, I'm also going to integrate RF and wireless communications and internet of things. IOT has been a big deal lately on how do you make your devices enabled? If you have a car, if you have a bicycle, if you have a product and you want to connect that to the internet to, um, to have uh, either maintenance information or control uh, then, so I'm gonna cover that. We're gonna cover a little bit about electric fields. We're gonna go from F equals MA to an electric field in a couple lectures, uh, just so you have a, a feel for an electric field if you don't have a feel for that now. And we're going to talk about collecting data and transmitting data over RF and wireless networks and wired networks to remotely sense control and acquire data. Um, and finally, this was big with the engineers that I talked to um, at, at where, where I work in industry, um, electronics design and manufacturing processes. So you've probably seen how to make a circuit board, but what does that process look like from design through test and where do mechanical engineers play a role in there? I can tell you they play a very important role in the design of electronics modules and electronic circuit boards. So I want to include that. And then I'll have several supporting topics that um, uh, components and um, uh, different things that will support those major topics. But basically, I'm trying to make this benefit uh, your other coursework and 
and your career or anybody who takes this class um, to prepare for future engineering work that you're going to see in industry or research on mechanical plus electrical systems, um, trying to also expand options for your senior design project that you'll take if you're if you're taking senior design uh, next year, uh, because as as I've uh, I, as I've been told the you know the first semester is um, uh, forming your team, coming up with an idea, doing a preliminary design review. And then you, you're building the uh, second semester. So in the first semester, I'd like to get some topics in there on sensors, controllers, remote communications, internet of things, communications, so that you can integrate that into your design. And I'm building it around um, hands-on work and skill development in electronics, hardware, software, and sensing and control. So, uh, and I'm going to put it all into uh, the context of mechanical applications, for example, when we talk about sensors, we're going to talk about Hall effect sensors, magnetic sensors, and talk about how that relates to sensing um, presence of, of metal objects, presence of magnetic fields, and how does that apply to, for example, analog braking systems, right, or traction control. So that's these are the typical types of sensors that are used in ABS brakes and, um, and traction control and, and, oh, it's that hill assist uh, systems. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about different temperature sensors and how do you know whether to choose a, you know, a, a thermocouple and what kind of thermocouple and if you're sensing um, cylinder head temperature or exhaust gas temperature and you're trying to optimize engine efficiency, like how do you how do you choose those those probes those sensors? We'll talk about that and then how do you use um, infrared detectors for applications other than just sensing infrared light, like uh, sensing obstacles and also putting those into a closed loop uh, control system to sense the speed of, of something rotating and then controlling that with a microcontroller. And we're also gonna talk about inertial measurement units, IMUs that, um, that are essentially accelerometers that give you acceleration in XYZ and um, uh, uh, a gyroscopic or a gyroscope capability so that you can tell um, uh, the rate of turn around each axis. And so what are those good for? Those are good for uh, attitude indicators and in aircraft and other things, just sensing tapping on your phone. Uh, the, these uh, accelerometers are used for those too. So this is all this is all built into, um, actually the, the Arduino board we're going to use has an IMU built, built into it. We're gonna do, do some uh, unusual added attitude control and control the project that I'm going to show you next. Yeah, this so this will be offered in fall 2023, and then um, depends if there's demand fall 2024, but probably not the spring. Maybe not unless there's enough demand for it, and we'll see. So the project is going to be central to the course. Um, I'm building this around real hands-on work, so it's going to emphasize building a project, working um, with probably one lab partner, seeing if people want to work alone, we might be able to pull that off too, but probably one lab partner. I want you to emphasize or to use your mechanical design skills, right, uh, to, to build the, the, the structure around this mini test cell that we're going to, to, uh, to build. So you'll apply your mechanical design skills um, I'm going to try to teach some new electronics knowledge. Hopefully, you know, you either have it, it'll be strengthened, or you haven't seen this before. So we're going to use components and uh, a new, uh, relatively new microcontroller board with built-in wireless, with built-in IMU. Um, and then it, it should look from the software should look familiar because uh, if you've if you've done any Arduino programming, then you have the skill set to come in to this course. And if not, there are these great workshops over the at the ITLL um, that uh, get you started on Arduinos. But it's going to emphasize um, hands-on work and cover technical information and applied theory as we design and build. So we're going to, going to be working on one thing throughout the semester um, and then touching all these sensor topics and RF topics and microcontroller topics and something that looks like this. Uh, so 
you're going to build a, a constant speed propeller test bed for an electric aircraft. We're not going to go fly it, but this is going to be a test bed so that you're going to control the speed of a motor, but it's going to be closed loop control. Uh, it's going to be commanded uh, via a network. Um, uh, there's going to, there are going to be sensors that the microcontroller responds to on board on this, um, on this test bed. And also, uh, we're going to offboard that information over the internet to, uh, to a display so that it's like a, it, essentially it's a test bed. It's like a flight test unit that, uh, uh, an emulator on the ground and something you could actually fly and, uh, and get data wirelessly off of. So the project is going to emphasize uh, practicing design, test, and troubleshooting uh, using electromechanical concepts um, sen and sensor and controlling hardware. And what we're going to do is this is going to culminate in we're going to take actual flight test data that's recorded during a, a flight off of a piston twin. And um, you're going to emulate on your test bed the RPM that was actually commanded during the test flight. And it's going to be a measured measured RPM acquired with the same um, with the same hardware you see here. I'm going to acquire the uh, the RPM off the engine, uh, 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 the right engine of a twin, and then you're going to match it with your project. It's going to be controlled over the internet. So you'll get a streaming, um, you get a stream of RPM at different phases of flight that you have to match. And so sounds might sound simple, might sound complicated, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna walk you through this, and I promise you'll come out with a really good experience of everything you see here: microcontrollers, motor control, um, controlling with MOSFETs. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, batteries, power supplies, um, different sensors, and then connect this to the internet. So I wanted to throw that out there um, and just say uh, I'm gonna start promoting this around. Uh, outside of the department, um, even for electrical engineers. And then, uh, uh, but I wanted to offer it here first. So will, so someone said, is it, will it be homework heavy? Um, I don't expect it to be homework heavy. The homework will be just enough so that you understand the concept of, for example, each sensor um, or controlling the motor, but nothing, I don't want it to be super electrical engineering theoretical. I want it to be practical. That's why it's called practical electronics, um, and uh, it'll uh, it'll it'll just emphasize. I think what you would need to know to become familiar with and even do some design with these elements if you were setting up a test. So that's what it is. If you're looking for it, I think it's listed under 4228. If you're a grad student, 5228. That will have probably a few extra problems in in the work. Um, and if you have any trouble finding that, let me know and I'll help you find that. So that's what that is. I wanted to throw that out there. Uh, and especially since we have a, a nice break between the topics we just covered. So we have just finished up um, transistors. Bring this up there. So we have just finished up Semiconductors, we talked about diodes and transistors, and this is the end of the material that will be covered on exam two. We talked about diodes being the one-way valves of electrical current and transistors as a way to control a lot of current using a little bit of current. So you can use some low power output of something like a microcontroller to control a lot of current, like current through a servo or a motor. Next, we're going to move into operational amplifiers. Operational amplifiers are really useful integrated circuits that let you build things like analog amplifiers. You want to take a signal and make it bigger, like for an audio signal to amplify it up for the input to maybe another amplifier or a speaker. Um, they let you do what I call analog signal processing or preconditioning where you can, you can you can add voltages together. You could subtract voltages. You could take differences. You could take integrals. You can um, take derivatives, all in the analog domain using operational amplifiers. We're going to concentrate on the amplifier circuits of op operational amplifiers. For example, imagine you had a pressure sensor that has a really 
low voltage output, maybe just a few millivolts, and you have a data acquisition device right, that has to acquire over a range of zero to five volts, then you need amplification in there to get accurate results. Op amps are an easy way to do that. Okay, so let's let's dig into op amps. So someone asked if I'm going to record office hours tonight so that um, people can watch the review, I guess, if, if you're not able to make it. Yes, I will record the review. Um, so anything that's review material, um, I will I will re record and post. And if you have any anything outside of the review material that you want to talk about, that, that will be not posted. So um, but if you're interested in the review material, I will post that. Okay, so this is the uh, start of operational amplifiers. And so uh, let's talk about op amps. So this is the schematic symbol of an operational amplifier, this triangle here with all of the terminals, all five terminals connected to it. And these plus minus symbols are important as well, which I'll explain. So what is an op amp? It's, a, it's an integrated circuit, an IC, um, which is a set of electronics manufactured on a semiconductor, a semiconductor chip. So you may have heard of or seen silicon wafers. This is a silicon wafer. It has a bunch of dye on it. So this wafer is cut up into dye and those uh, dye are packaged individually into these uh, plastic packages or ceramic packages or otherwise, um, or, or sometimes they can be used directly on circuit boards and wire bonded to, but what we will see in class um, are the plastic packages, the dual inline pin packages like you see here. Op amps function as a high gain differential amplifier. So high gain means you take a, uh, a voltage and multiply it by a big number. A gain is a multiplication of a voltage or a current. So the voltage um, that it's looking for as an input is multiplied by a big number. It, it's a differential amplifier because the op amp looks at the difference between two voltages and it multiplies that value. So it's a high gain differential amplifier. On the left, you have the inputs. Okay, so the, and, and on the right, you have uh, the output. So the inputs consist of uh, two voltages, V1 and V2. The terminal V1, or the terminal associated with V1, is called the non inverting input. The other one's called the inverting input. That's the one next to the minus sign. So you'll hear me say this a lot. You'll hear me say, what's the voltage at the, uh, the non-inverting input? So the non-inverting input has the plus next to it. The inverting input has the minus next to it. Those are not power supplies. They are just indicators of which input is which. Um, and there's no reason the plus has to be put on top. If the plus is put on the bottom, then the non-inverting input is put on the bottom there. Okay, so those are the inputs. The output, we, we will label the voltage V out. That's the output voltage. Now this integrated circuit is an active integrated circuit. Um, it means it takes power. You need to apply a power supply to an op amp in order for it to function. It has signals in, it has a signal out, but you have to power the, the op amp for it to do what you want it to do. So one of the power supply connections is called the positive supply. It's usually a value like plus five volts, plus 10 volts, plus 15 volts. We're going to call that positive supply voltage VCC. I'll show you mainly because it's connected to the collectors of transistors. The other supply voltage is usually connected to either ground or a negative voltage. I'll show you why that is, why you want a negative voltage there. So that negative supply voltage is called uh, we're going to call it VEE, -E. okay? So VCC and VEE. -E. VCC is connected to a lot of the collectors of the transistors inside this chip. 
BEE is connected to a lot of the emitters inside this chip. Okay. So here is what this op amp does. It is a high gain differential amplifier. So here is the equation describing a high gain differential amplifier. So first, high gain, AOL. AOL is the gain, uh, and it's a big number. It's typically uh, 10,000, greater than 10,000, less than a million somewhere, but it's a pretty big number. The differential part is this, V1 minus V2. That's a differential voltage, the difference between two voltages. So this op amp takes the difference between these two voltages, right? The difference between these voltages at the inputs, multiplies it by a big number, the open loop gain, and produces that at the output. That's what an op amp does. Every op amp does that, that we will look at in this class. And we will look at different circuits that you can make because of this functionality, okay? Um, sometimes we call the input voltage into the op amp VID, the input differential voltage VID. And that just lets you express uh, the, the equation this way, AOL times VID, where VID is the input differential voltage, the difference between V1 and V2. So both of these equations mean the same thing. Um, they're both operating on the difference, uh, the voltage difference at the inputs, producing an output that is a big number times the difference, okay? So op amps, can look like this. Here is an op amp integrated circuit that actually has many op amps inside of it. It has four. This is the LM324 op amp. That's just the part number right there. This chip has four independent op amps in it. So one, two, three, four here. All of these op amps are powered by uh, a common a uh, pair of supply voltages. So V plus here on the data sheet is what we will call VCC. So VCC is the positive supply voltage. Ground is what we call VEE. And in reality, this diagram is kind of poorly named because ground doesn't have to be ground. It can be a negative supply voltage, like negative 15 volts. So when you look at data sheets, you're going to see different terminologies, different ways of calling out, well, all of these pins, and you kind of figure out uh, what matches what you know. So here, VCC is pin four, uh, VEE is pin 11. You can identify which side is which of this chip because of this little notch here. You see this notch at the end? That notch um, indicates this notch here, and usually, if you turn your head sideways to the left of that notch, uh, that is pin one on all of the chips, the chips that look like this, okay? And so you, uh, so if you want to use op amp number one, here are your two inputs, here's your output. You just power the chip. We'll talk about what voltages to use, but you power your chip and you get that op amp and you can not use the other op amps. If you need three op amps, you can use any three of these. And, um, and you have them available or use all of them. So someone asks, is the value of AOL dependent on the circuit coming from the supply or is AOL predetermined in the data sheet for the components? That's a good question. So AOL is usually given for a particular op amp under certain conditions. It's, and it varies widely, like it could be Oh, between 50,000 and 150,000, right? What good is that? And it might vary with supply voltage and, and it might vary with temperature. But op amps can be used in a way, and we're going to use op amps in this way, where the exact value of AOL, the gain, doesn't matter. Only that it's big. So what does big mean? We'll talk about what big means, but it has to be big, like in that 10,000, 100,000 range, because you're going to build your circuit such that the circuit's gain, let's, let's say you want to multiply a voltage by 10, 
that circuit's gain of 10 is going to depend on resistor values external to this chip, okay, and not the AOL itself. That way, if AOL varies between 75,000 and 125,000, you wouldn't notice. Um, that's okay because we're going to we're going to come up with a result, a, a circuit gain that's independent of the AOL particular AOL, AOL value. As long as it's big, it's just got to be big, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so what is this strange op amps symbol? What is inside of there and why do we need this op amp on a chip? Why don't we just go use transistors? Well, you could, but you'd wind up building something that looks like this. So inside this LM324 chip, and then for each one of these op amps, functionally, it looks like this. Here are the inputs on the left. Right, here's the inverting input with a minus sign, the non-inverting input with a plus sign. Here's the output on the right. Uh, VCC is up here at the V plus terminal. VEE is connected to all of these grounds down here. They actually get connected to one, to one terminal, one of those pins. And so um, there are many stages of amplifiers here. There's a differential amplifier right here, right? So that's a differential amplifier. And then here's the output of that differential amplifier going to other stages of amplifiers. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Here are some current sources. Um, I think there's a here's a capacitor in here to keep it stable. So if you have high gain and you get some feedback, you know what feedback is, right? You'll get you'll get an oscillation. That capacitor cuts off the high frequency of the oscillation with a low pass filter. Here's the output over here. It looks like there's an output stage. Uh, with a transistor going to ground and a transistor coming from the supply. That's a push-pull amplifier. So there's a lot of stuff going on in here that you don't have to worry about. Right? So the manufacturer designed this chip to be a high-gain differential amplifier. The output voltage is going to be a big number times the difference between the input voltages, okay? And then they work out all the details on what has to go on in that chip to make it stable, to make it have high gain, to make it able to supply enough current to work over the voltage range, to work over the frequency range. And that's, that's what goes on in here. So that's why these are wonderful little devices that take a lot of design responsibility off of you when you just need times 10, or I just need times five, times 10, whatever. Um, these are great for that. So you don't need to know what goes on in here. You don't have to study this. I just wanted to show you uh, this is an application of transistors. It's it's a you know, fairly complicated circuit, and it functions as a high gain differential amplifier. And we're going to concentrate on how to use these op amps in practical circuits versus building op amps at the chip level. OK, so let's start talking about how to use op amps. So here's, here's some guidance. We're going to start out um, talking about analysis of op amp circuits. You have an op amp circuit, you're given voltages. How do you figure out what the output voltage is? Things like that. Um, and then we're going to do some design problems with, with op amps. Once you know how to use them, you get used to analyzing them. I'll tell you, we are going to use op amps for primarily two purposes in this class. And these are the main purposes of op amps. Um, we're going to create circuits that perform linear functions like amplifiers or filters or summers. Those are all linear functions. We're gonna concentrate on amplifiers for the design part. Right, what's an amplifier? It takes a it takes a voltage and multiplies it by a number, either greater than one, less than one, doesn't matter, but it multiplies it by a gain. So that's the first purpose. The second purpose is to compare voltages. Right, this is kind of a surprising thing you can do with an amplifier. When you compare voltages uh, with a circuit, that's usually called a comparator. Okay, a comparator compares two voltages. So is one voltage higher than another? An example of that is you have a thermostat with a set point and you have a temperature sensor with maybe, you know, it's, its output is one volt at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if the 
um, uh, you know, as the temperature goes up and down, that voltage changes, and then you have a set point. Okay, the, the, the set point is what you set with your knob, the, the output of the um, temperature sensor is some variable voltages. And you want to know, is the sensor output higher or lower than the set point? So you know whether or not to turn the heater on. That's why you want to compare two voltages and have an output that says high or low, high or low, high, turn the heater on, low, turn the heater off. You can do that with a comparator. So here's some guidance on, well, you have a circuit in front of you. It's an op amp circuit. How do you know which, which circuit it is, right? Is it number one or number two? So here's how you do that. This is the decision tree. We're going to talk about negative feedback. So I'll define that in a minute, but I want to show you the tree. If a circuit has negative feedback, I'll show you how to identify that. That's going to be number one, the linear op amp circuit. And you're going to use a process that I'll show you to analyze that circuit. And you can analyze that circuit in two ways. Um, you can use this negative feedback approach. I'll show you that. Or once you've used this approach and you recognize the circuit and it's common, you're going to call it a common circuit and you know the gain. Okay, so we will go through this process. If negative feedback is not present, then you have a comparator circuit. And the comparator circuits we're going to talk about are simple comparators, which have one threshold, or comparators with hysteresis, which have two thresholds. Okay. So this is high level. We haven't, uh, you know, this, this um, might not be clear right now, or it may be clear, but I wanted to show you that as we go along through talking about op amps, this is the decision tree. We're going to go down, first talk about negative feedback and linear op amp circuits. And then we're going to talk about op amp circuits without negative feedback. And those will be comparator circuits that compare two voltages. Okay. All right. So let's go down the left side of this branch, the um, negative feedback side. Okay. And so let's talk about analyzing a circuit with negative feedback. Here's an op amp, I've got the input differential voltage. I've also uh, drawn two currents here into the inputs of the op amp. So here is how you identify negative feedback. Simply stated, there is some connection between the output of the op amp and the inverting input. If you can if you can trace some connection on the schematic with your finger and you go through resistors or voltage sources or something like that, it doesn't matter, but you have some kind of circuit, but you can trace your way back to the inverting input, the one with the minus sign, then you have negative feedback. Okay, not the positive sign, that would be positive feedback. You don't wanna do that. Negative feedback has some connection between the output and the inverting input, the one with the negative sign. So if you have some path, some circuit, it's usually simple, between the op amp's output and the inverting input, then assume you have negative feedback. Okay, that's how you're going to identify negative feedback. What's happening is some of the output is fed back into the input, and it's causing the output to impact or influence the input um, and actually make it more stable. So here's this little asterisk here. This path cannot have a node that is held at a node voltage by a power supply or ground connection. So what that means is um, if you have some power supply or ground connection here in this connection between the output and the inverting input, such that the output cannot influence the inverting input's voltage, right? There's, it has no control, it can't change it, then that's not negative feedback. That wouldn't be negative feedback. So the output has to have some influence on the inverting input's voltage in order to call this negative feedback. I'll show you an example of that when we get to comparators. So once you have identified negative feedback, you go down the left side of this tree and you analyze the op amp circuit um, using this approach. So first, because you have negative feedback, 
the input differential voltage gets driven to approximately zero. So, so the output actually causes the input voltage, the input differential voltage over a little bit of time to fall to zero or almost zero. It's not exactly zero, it's a few, few microvolts. But it's really close to zero compared to every other voltage in the circuit. Okay, and so it goes something like this. Um, I'm gonna post a video on, on deriving why this happens, but it's too long for a lecture, but I, I'd like to show it to you. So I'll, I'll post a supplemental video, but what happens is something like this. Let's suppose that you apply a volt, a positive voltage to VID. If you apply a positive voltage, one volt to VID, the output it takes a little time to do this. The output starts rising dramatically because it started out maybe at zero volts and you have a, uh, a, an AOL of a million, it's trying to go up to a million volts. But as it's trying to rise through the feedback network, it's also causing the inverting inputs voltage to rise. If the inverting inputs voltage starts to rise, that shrinks VID. And so as the output rises, VID gets smaller and rises more, VID gets smaller. And VID goes down to finally converges at approximately zero. This is a feedback loop. If you've taken control systems, this is a feedback loop and VID is the error voltage, okay? So you can think of it that way or not. We're going to use this uh, set of rules to, to analyze the op-amp circuit so that you can get amplifiers to work instead of concentrating on some of the details of the, of the op-amp circuit. Okay, so if you have negative feedback, assume VID is zero. And then because op amps, the way they're designed, have very high impedance inputs, they look like big resistors to ground. The, the, the current into the inputs is really small. It's very small. It could be microamps, nanoamps, something really small. So we're just going to assume that I1 and I2 are zero amps. Right? They're just really small values that helps us analyze the circuit. That has nothing to do with negative feedback. It's just because op amps typically have very high impedance inputs. Okay, so those are the two assumptions that we're going to make once we see negative feedback is present. We're gonna make those two assumptions that greatly simplifies analysis of op amp circuits, which I'll show you. Okay, and then we're going to analyze the circuit using Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law, voltage division, current division, whatever, whatever we have, we go back to the basics, okay? Um, so I'm going to work an example next, but before I drop the slides and move to the whiteboard, does anybody have any questions about anything I said so far on op amps? And if you've worked with op amps in the past, shoot out a chat, let me know. I'm curious how many folks have worked with uh, op amps in the class. Usually not too many, but, but I get a few. Okay. Let's move over to the whiteboard. Okay, so I'm gonna work an example of an op amp circuit and show you the steps that I just described. Okay, let's start out with an op amp. So here's the op amp. I am not actually going to draw in the power supply connections. When you see an op amp drawn without power supply connections, you just assume that it, it is sufficiently powered, okay? It has power supplies sufficiently applied so that um, uh, it, the circuit will work. And we will work circuits where you, you do need to know the power supply voltages, but in this case, we do not need to know that. Okay, so I'm gonna come out here. And do this and notice I put the inverting input on top just because it's 
easier to draw the circuit if I put the inverting input on top. And this is V out. Okay, so I'm going to call that V out, I'll put that in a different color, so highlight that. And this is V in over here. And let's give these resistors some values. This is R2, and this is R1. So I will tell you, let's see, what will I tell you about this? Um, so VN is an input voltage to the circuit. It's not the input voltage to this op amp, right? Because there's a resistor here. So something's gonna happen here. Um, v out is the output voltage of the circuit, which is also connected to the output of the op amp. I'll tell you, this is an amplifier. This V out is equal to some function of V in, and it's going to be a, a, a linear amplifier. Um, and it's gonna do this, so V out, is going to be some value we're going to call A sub V times V in. Now this isn't AOL, this is AV. Um, it's a different gain. AV is the voltage gain of the circuit. Voltage gain of circuit. Not the voltage gain of the op amp. The voltage gain of the op amp is AOL, and it is still true that V out equals AOL times VID, right? That's, that's still true, but, but these are two different voltages. VID is not VN, and AOL is not AV. We're going to find the voltage gain of the overall circuit, not of the individual op amp. Okay, so let's find AV. A sub V, I should write that more clearly. Okay, and that equals V out over V in. So we have to find some expression, some equation that has V out and V in. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> let's follow the decision tree and the analysis rules. First, I try to identify, does this circuit have negative feedback? I claim it does because there is some connection between the output and the inverting input, right? There's a connection through that resistor. The output can influence the voltage of the inverting input. So this circuit does have negative feedback. And once I've identified the circuit has negative feedback, um, I can say this, well, the, the guideline number one, rule number one was the input differential voltage is zero volts. Okay, it's approximately zero volts. I'll show you why. Um, so that's true. And then the second guideline rule is that the current into the inputs of the op amp is zero amps. Okay, so zero, zero amps into the input, zero volts between the inputs. And now, once I do that, I have to analyze using KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, whatever, to try to figure out what, what is some relationship between V out and V in. Okay, so let's do that. I claim that if I, let's see, if I write a KCL equation at this node right here, that I will get an equation that has V in, V out, and known values. We're assuming we know R1 and R2. Okay, so, so what do I want to do? I want to, let's, let's sum the currents um, leaving this node. Let's sum that current plus the current into the op amp plus that current. 
Now, one thing I should mention here is as you start getting into more complex um, schematics, wh when I have an input uh, drawn here, it's, it's assumed this is some kind of source supplying that node voltage. Just like, just like in the transistor circuits that we looked at, uh, when you had a node voltage that was a power supply um, or an input, you assume there's some source here. So current can be supplied or, or sunk from that, from that node right there. Okay, so well, let's do this. Let's, let's write a KCL equation at that red node here. Okay, well, let's see. The, um, let's figure out what, well, what voltage might I use for that red node? Well, we know that the node connected to ground, the non-inverting input node here, that's a node voltage of zero volts, right? Ground is a zero volt node voltage. I know that I have zero volts between the non-inverting input and the inverting input, right? There's zero volts between, there's no voltage difference between these two nodes here. So if this node is zero volts, then this node is also zero volts, that red node, right? Ground is zero volts. There's no voltage difference between ground and the red node. So, so there's zero volts uh, at node voltage at both of those nodes. Someone asked, why, why did we make uh, current zero again? Because op amps have high impedance inputs. If I look at like this input right here, it looks like a big resistor to ground and the big resistor might be a hundred mega ohms, right? And so this is the, in this case, inverting input, the non-inverting input, that also looks like a big resistor to ground. And if I apply one volt here, I'm going to get nano amps flowing, which is approximately zero compared to the other currents flowing in the circuit. So, so you can assume that the current into the op amp is zero because of this characteristic of the op amp. Okay. So now that we know this node is zero volts, I can write a KCL equation, sort of using the node voltage analysis approach. So the current leaving to the left through R1 is zero minus V in over R1. The current leaving into the op amp is approximately zero. The current leaving through R2 to the right is zero minus V out over R2. Okay, sum the currents leaving. We set that, um, we set that uh, equal to zero, okay? And, and yes, you have that, you have that zero, the zero is important. We have to assume that zero so we can solve this. Uh, and so yes, that is a characteristic of all typical op amps, right? I'm sure there's some op amps where they're specialized, they don't do that, but any op amp you will encounter in this class or order a general purpose op amp, n even when it's not in a negative feedback configuration, op amps have high impedance inputs. Okay, so let's see, I can solve this. I can move V out over R2 to the right, let's see, V out over R2 equals minus V in over R1. Okay, and then I can say V out equals minus R2 over R1 Vn. Okay, so that's what this circuit does. And the gain is the coefficient of Vn, right? AV equals V out over Vn. So AV equals minus R2 over R1. Okay, so we've created an amplifier here. Um, assuming because this op amp has a big gain, it drives the input differential voltage to zero, but the gain of the overall circuit is set by these resistor values, R2 over R1. And so, what that does is this, if you have um, some input, let's say a sine wave, 
versus time. This is voltage. And that's an input voltage, Vn, right? That's Vn of t. And let's suppose, I'm just gonna make this up. We, we use a five K ohm resistor. It's gotta be negative, negative five K ohm over one K ohm. So we have a gain of negative five. So V out is negative five times V in. Well then if I put one volt in, I get negative five volts out. So the output, I messed that up. So Vn peaks at one volt here, then V out would be down here, negative five, oops, negative five volts, you can see that. And so this amplifier actually is making the signal bigger by a factor of five and it's inverting the signal, okay? So this amplifier, is called an inverting amplifier. This is a very common circuit that you will see in electronics. An op amp with two resistors configured like this, we call that an inverting amplifier because it applies a gain and it inverts the signal. It flips it about the time axis, okay? All right. So hit the wall on time. We will continue with other op amps uh, in just a little bit. So for now, uh, don't forget the exam is on Wednesday, March 22nd. So two days from now, uh, I posted the details via Canvas. And you'll, uh, so check that out. If you have any questions, stop by office hours. Um, I'm going to work exam review problems at office hours in just a few seconds. If you want to stick around, I will post that video of the review portion of, uh, of the office hours. So thanks for joining the live class. If you'd like to join office hours, please join. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.